The few real stars on the football field today owe their success to being capable of the right action at the right moment, usually with the result that they beat one, two or even more players. If they could not make these great moves, then football would lose even more spectator appeal. It is much more exciting for the public and will bring more success to the team when players can beat opponents in dozens of different situations during a match, rather than just pass the ball on to teammates who cannot beat the opposites either. This can be very frustrating because it will frequently result in loss of ball possession when the objective of gaining control of the ball in the first place was to keep it and eventually score a goal when the right opportunity has been created. I think you start to learn this in the streets where it is essential to beat other players or you can't score because there isn't much room. I also think you must really want to beat your opponent, not just to try to faint, but want to get past to feed other players. That's how you start to develop those certain movements. It's a sort of feeling. You can practice certain fainting movements, so you know what you are doing, but in matches the unexpected situation confronts you and forces you to try and pass. You don't know beforehand what you are going to do. You must practice and learn timing the feint. You should do it in practice and in matches, and practice in match-related situations. The theme of this instalment, then, is beating an opponent. Football with Coach Wheel Curver a graceful master himself, demonstrating the first exercise. Pivot the ball with the inside of the instep. Take it away with the inside of the other foot. Then pivot it under the body, again with the inside of the instep. The group try it too. You have to stay inside the lines in this exercise. Pivot the ball with the inside of the instep. Play it forward with the inside of the other foot and pivot it under your body again with the inside of the instep. Here you see it in slow motion. All the top players owe their class to the fact that they can make a decisive move at the right moment by beating an opponent, or perhaps even more than one. That's what this exercise is for. Pivot the ball with the inside of the instep. Take it away with the inside of the other foot. Then pivot it under the body again with the inside of the instep. The second exercise for beating an opponent. The spectacular scissors. Step over or around the ball and take it away explosively with the outside of the other foot. That's the scissors. You've probably heard of it. Well, this is how it's done. Step over or around the ball, then take it away with the outside of the other foot, giving it all the power you've got. Step over the ball, take it away with the outside of your other foot with full power, explosively. The group practices the scissors. The foot slides over the ball supplely and smoothly. Then the other foot takes over. Like the first, this exercise has to be done with both feet. And now watch the feet performing this beautiful feint. You start each exercise with a stationary ball. Then you begin to practice at speed. And finally, you practice with an opponent, because later, in a match, there will be one. Your opposition has gradually increased. You must really master the technique, otherwise you'll keep on losing the ball. But that's what all the practice is for. Step over or around the ball, then take it away explosively with the outside of the other foot. That's the scissors. If you can do it at top speed, you'll drive your opponent mad. The third exercise is the double scissors. You step over the ball quickly with your left foot, then with your right, 
and take it away explosively with the outside of your left foot. Put as much power as possible into the final move so as to come away at speed. It's also beautiful to watch in slow motion. A wonderful technique, the double scissors. It's toying with your opponent, but to do it requires many hours of practice to master it thoroughly. Step quickly over the ball with your left leg, then your right, or vice versa, and take it away explosively with the outside of your foot. The group practicing at speed, over the ball with both legs in quick succession, and away with the outside of the foot. Over the ball with both legs in quick succession, then away with the outside of the foot. And this is how the cameraman will be seeing you later, if you've practiced for all you're worth and are playing top class football. But all that's in the future. First the practice, with opposition now. The double scissors. You step over the ball, first with your left leg, then with your right, and take it away explosively with the outside of your left foot. The double scissors is highly successful in a match because it's extremely difficult for your opponent to follow it. It requires a lot of skill though. In the beginning, you'll find yourself tripping over your own feet, but it won't be long before you're on your way to mastering it. In the fourth exercise, Coach Curver bears his weight springingly on one leg, draws the ball towards him with the inside of his other foot, then takes it away with the outside of that foot. In slow motion now, you support yourself springingly on one leg, draw the ball towards you with the inside of your foot, then take it away at full throttle with the outside of the same foot. Here's the group practicing the fourth exercise. The final move is done with a burst of power as you take the ball away with the outside of your foot. It's always enjoyable to beat an opponent. All these exercises can also be practiced at home. You take a friend with you and the two of you can take turns in attacking and defending. It's a pleasant kind of homework, but you must always try to aim for perfection. You support yourself springingly on one leg. Draw the ball towards you with the inside of the other foot, then play it with the outside of that foot. And watch your opponent closely in all of these moves, because naturally, it's important to make them at the right moment. In the fifth exercise, again you support your weight springingly on one leg, but instead of taking the ball away with the outside of your other foot, you step sideways with it and take the ball away with the outside of the foot. Once again, because it sounds a bit complicated, you stand springingly on one leg, but instead of taking the ball away with the outside of your other foot, you place it on the ground to the side and take the ball away with the outside of the foot. Now the fifth exercise with opponents. It can be practiced in threes, as you see, in which case you have the additional task of making a good pass. As a footballer, you must be capable of going round an opponent on either side. If you can do that, your opponent will never know which way you're going. Otherwise, by the end of the first half, he'll have your measure. Vary your plays, and you'll have him going in circles, and the spectators will enjoy themselves. Watch it carefully in slow motion. Support yourself springingly on one leg. Then, instead of taking the ball away with the outside of your other foot, place it on the ground to the side and take the ball away with the outside of the foot. The sixth exercise is also a really clever one. 
You pretend to be about to play the ball past your opponent with your right foot, but draw the ball across your body and play it past him with the inside of your other foot. Pretend to be about to play the ball past your opponent with your right foot. Instead of that, though, you draw the ball across the front of your body and play the ball past him with the inside of your left foot. You've caught him on the wrong foot, and there's nothing he can do about it. After you've done that to him a few times, he may want to throw in the towel. The same exercise, but now with opponents. Beating an opponent is one of the most important elements of attacking football. In many situations, not only do the spectators like it better if you beat your man, it's also the right thing to do from the point of view of the success of your team. Because otherwise, there's not much else you can do than hand the ball over to a teammate who can't beat his man either. And if you can't do that, the only thing that remains is to give it a boot and hope for the best. Practicing beating your man improves the quality of your game and also the enjoyment you get from it. Seventh technique for beating an opponent. Again, Coach Curver demonstrates. You pretend to be about to pivot the ball inwards, but surprise your opponent by taking it away quickly and powerfully with the outside of the same foot. Pretend to pivot the ball inwards, but take it away with the outside of the same foot. You make your opponent think you're going to pivot it inwards, but take it away with the outside of the foot. A perfect technique. It's not only attackers, though, who have to be able to beat a man. Defenders must be able to do it, too. They have to get the ball to their attackers, because even the best attackers can't do a thing unless they're fed by defenders who can handle their opponents and give themselves room to place their passes. In this exercise, you pretend you're going to pivot the ball inwards, but take it away with the outside of the same foot. It looks simple, but it becomes simple only after long and patient practice together with teammates or friends from school or the neighbourhood. Remember, all these exercises can be done at home or in the school playground. Pretend to pivot the ball inwards. Instead, take it away with the outside of your foot. The eighth and last exercise in this instalment has been devoted entirely to beating an opponent. You pretend to pivot the ball, but take it away with the other foot. Pretend to be about to pivot the ball, but take it away with your other foot. Make your opponent think you're going to pivot the ball. Instead, play it with the other foot. If you're capable of beating a man, you're worth more to your team than players who only know how to get rid of the ball. Naturally, this exercise too has to be practiced with opponents. The opponents don't make life too difficult for you at first, but they do later, as the opposition you're up against has increased 100%. These then were the techniques for beating an opponent. Next time, we'll be looking at sliding tackles, a spectacular and exciting means of regaining possession as quickly as possible after you've lost the ball.
One of the most important reasons to teach young players the right way to make sliding tackles is that the risk of injury to attacker or defenders in a properly executed tackle is nil. Another reason is that, since you are teaching them attacking techniques, they are keen to attack and block their opponents in their own half. In this situation, the confidence of being able to carry out a perfect sliding tackle gives them a safe feeling when the last man has moved up to the center field and the defenders in the back line are operating on a one-on-one -on -one basis. This is intended to prevent a quick counter movement and especially to apply pressure and force their opponents to make mistakes. At these times, even the best players must be able to make a sliding tackle in order to regain control of the ball as quickly as possible. In a match, you often use a sliding technique when you cannot get to the ball any other way. So as a last resort, you try to win the ball with the sliding tackle. Over the years, you teach yourself these things. You cannot say that you learn it in the streets. You cannot make sliding tackles there. Maybe the only thing you did learn there is the toughness that allows you to risk going to the ground sooner. Then you develop the technique which suits you best. That's the way I learned. You try to use the best approach to recapture the ball as efficiently as possible. I don't think I am very good at making sliding tackles, that's why I rarely use them. Not intentionally, of course, it just works out differently. Does it really come naturally? For some people, perhaps, but most players have problems with the sliding tackle. All of us must learn how to carry them out well. The first exercise is the sliding tackle with the outside of the foot. Sliding tackle with the outside of the foot. The sliding tackle is the only defensive technique we shall deal with here. Part of the reason is that if a sliding tackle is technically perfect, the risk of injury to the defender as well as the attacker is nil. The sliding tackle with the outside of the foot. Continue the slide, leg on the ground and get up quickly again. Play the ball away with the outside of the foot. Practice it well, go into it supplely and get up again quickly. Because here too, the speed with which it is carried out is important. The first sliding tackle exercise. Play the ball with the outside of the foot. With the outside of the foot. In the second exercise, we use an opponent. The opponent's role is even more important in sliding tackles than in other exercises. Because if the tackle is carried out incorrectly, there's a risk of injury. That's why the coach himself acts as the opponent. The sliding tackle then, with the outside of the foot. You can put the suppleness and agility you learned in previous exercises to good use here. In practicing sliding tackles, it's advisable to wear special trousers of soft canvas to prevent scraping. The tackle should be performed with both the left and the right leg. As you'll know by now, being able to use both feet is vital for a football. A player who can use only one foot will never get to the top. The leg used for the tackle must stay close to the ground, aimed only at the ball. Otherwise you get fouls and the risk of injury. Play the ball with the outside of the foot. Timing is very important with a sliding tackle. You have to reach the ball at precisely the right moment. You'll develop the sense of timing through constant practice. A third exercise in this instalment on sliding tackles. 
the sliding tackle with the outside of the ankle on the ground. Play the ball with the sole of the boot. Tap the ball away with the sole. Even technically gifted players must be able to perform sliding tackles in order to regain possession as quickly as possible. Even the best players lose the ball sometimes. And outstanding defenders sometimes face outstanding attackers who have a whole range of techniques for beating their man. If an opponent like this is about to get out of range, you have to use a sliding tackle. Like this one, for example, with the outside of the ankle on the ground and play the ball with a sole. In slow motion, you can also see that you're taught to sit up as straight as possible when you do a sliding tackle. The ball is played away with the sole of the boot. The outside of the ankle must stay on the ground. Tap the ball away with the sole. Remember the injury risk. If you do it properly, with your ankle on the ground, your leg low, there is very little risk. In the fourth exercise, you do precisely the same thing, but with an opponent. Keep the outside of the ankle on the ground and play the ball with the sole. Watch out for the supporting leg, because there must be no fouls. You have to keep on practicing sliding tackles no matter how dirty your trousers get. It's also a good thing to learn to do sliding tackles when you're very young. It's easier for young children to learn to fall and really slide along the ground. And once you've learned how to do a sliding tackle, you never forget, provided your body stays supple. In other words, as long as you keep fit. Keep the outside of your ankle on the ground. Play the ball with the sole of your boot. Always play the ball, never your opponent. So keep your leg on the ground. Play the ball with your sole. The sliding tackle is the ideal means of regaining possession quickly. And provided it's carried out properly, it's also spectacular. Play the ball with the sole of your boot and keep the outside of your ankle on the ground. The fifth exercise. Again, a sliding tackle with a sole. Pay special attention now to the other leg, which is bent under the body. The sliding tackle is not only an important weapon for defenders. Attackers should be able to do it too. If you're on the attack and you lose the ball trying to beat a man, you may be able to get it back with a sliding tackle. You can also use a sliding tackle to deprive a defender of the ball when the other team is in possession. This keeps the defence under pressure. This exercise involves carrying out a sliding tackle with your other leg under your body and playing the ball with the sole of the boot. The ball is played to you and you return it with a sliding tackle using the sole of the boot. Your other leg tucked under your body. The same exercise in slow motion. Play the ball with the sole. The other leg is bent under your body. If you're in good condition and your body is supple and loose, you'll be able to learn sliding tackles easily. If not, it will be more difficult. But it is important to be able to make an effective sliding tackle. You put pace in the game and avoid loss of possession. After a sliding tackle, you have to get up again quickly to get yourself back into the game. We're making progress already in sliding tackle techniques. Play the ball with the sole, straight back to the other player. Your leg bent under your body. Play the ball with the sole towards another player. Keep your other leg bent under your body. The tackling leg should be stretched out, close to the ground. After the tackle, get up quickly 
because a player on the ground isn't much use to anyone. Sliding tackles are useful for both defenders and attackers. Though the sliding tackle is defensive in nature, attackers must master it in order to be capable of regaining possession. A well-executed sliding tackle may make it possible to stay on the attack. If it fails, your opponents will still have the ball, which means a chance for them to attack. In the seventh exercise, you slide it towards the ball and trap it with the inside of your foot. As you will realize, this is the ideal way of regaining possession. Trap the ball with the inside of your foot. Get up quickly and shield the ball. You can see in slow motion how effective this technique is. The key is to trap the ball. And when you get up, you must make sure that it's shielded. All your opponent can do is stand and watch. Now we're going to practice trapping the ball with the inside of the foot, but with an opponent. This is the most difficult sliding tackle. Part of the reason is that if you want to retain possession, you have to get up quickly and shield the ball. Because it's such a difficult kind of sliding tackle, it needs a lot of practicing. Top class players practice too. These exercises also improve your physical condition. Your body becomes more athletic and supple as you constantly slide, trap the ball and jump up again. A perfect exercise. The ninth exercise is demanding. Two players kick the balls out of the marked area using sliding tackles. Sliding tackle after sliding tackle, with the sole, with the outside of the foot. And the tempo must be increased. You have to get to the ball faster, slide faster. And again, you'll be improving your level of physical fitness without noticing it. You will find exercise 10 is even harder work. Opponents dribble inside the marked off area and you have to deprive them of the ball with sliding tackles. Play the ball out of the area with a sliding tackle. This has been an installment full of tackles. You can practice them yourself. Provided it's carried out properly, a sliding tackle is spectacular to watch and always successful. In the next session, we'll have group games and kicking technique. Kicking technique? Just watch number 14, Johan Cruyff. Goal! In the previous six instalments, you've learned how to acquire the suppleness that's so essential by means of a well thought out and varied program of exercises. You have learned the importance of fast footwork. We've also shown you how tremendous it is to have mastered various feints and techniques for beating an opponent, which enable you to play better football. You have learned the spectacular sliding tackle. Once we've started feeling at home with all these basic techniques, 
we can start playing group games. First of all, without goals. Players must maintain control of their techniques even under pressure from opponents. So in this form of group games, even without goals, they must be able to make the best use of each ball opportunity and try out the movements which appeal to them most in specific situations. In the previous exercises and competitive games, the players were expected to exercise maximum ball control in order to perfect the skills. Now they must use their initiative and take risks. If young players can develop special skills and leg techniques in these and the larger group games, we can then start working on their team and tactical insights. We start by playing one against one. There are also two partners. A player can pass to one of them after a move but the partner has to return the ball to the pair with one touch. In this game, you can make use of every exercise you have learned to stay in possession. As you can see in these slow motion pictures, the boys try everything they know to stay on top of their opponent. It's all feints and maneuvers to beat their man. Naturally, they don't always work, in which case the opponent becomes the attacker and pulls out all the stops. After one or more successful moves, the attacker can pass to a partner who puts the ball back in play. And if it doesn't work the first time, keep on trying. In exercise two, we play with two pairs, one against one with four partners around the marked off field. This creates a bit more confusion and makes it more difficult to concentrate on the ball and your opponent. In a real game, when you have the ball, you shouldn't be looking for some way to get rid of it. You should try to beat your man. How you're going to do it, you must decide for yourself. These exercises are extremely useful in helping you to find out. These boys can try everything. Pivoting the ball, stepping over it, turning, feints. In short, they can put all the basic techniques into practice. The partners have an important role in this exercise. Because two balls are being used, they must react quickly. In exercise three, you see two yellows playing against two blues. Four partners in grey tracksuits are there to help. When they receive the ball, they have to put it back into play accurately first time. Now you have a teammate you can try one-two combinations. But first, you have to beat your opponent. We've already learned how to do this, though a lot of practice will still be needed before you can carry out the various techniques to perfection. When you play a game with the several partners on the field, you gradually begin to feel like someone, as a footballer. You've got past your opponent. You've caught him on the wrong foot, or turned away from him, and the way's clear to the partner. You have to pass the ball accurately to him and the partner plays the ball on with one touch. Moreover, this exercise is extremely good for your physical condition. In exercise four, you also have two against two, but now there are two partners instead of four. This means that, whereas you had four possibilities for passing after a successful move, now you've only got two. This makes it more difficult to place a pass. You can also score in this game by dribbling the ball over the line. The team that scores retains possession. This is important if you're practicing with friends. The team that scores keeps the ball. In exercise five, we play three against three, with three one-touch partners in grey tracksuits. Not only are short pass combinations possible now, you can also make use of the long pass, or rather, the longer pass. As you see, with each exercise, you make a little more progress in your grasp of play situations and passing the ball. 
at the same time trying out the basic techniques to your heart's content. But even greater demands are also made of you as regards physical fitness. In this exercise, you have to find open spaces, do short sprints, for example in one-two combinations, and keep on positioning yourself well. All of this develops your grasp of the game. In playing three against three with three partners, you already need a good grasp in order to place your passes. There are no partners in exercise six. We play two against two, and a side can score by dribbling the ball over the line. The side that scores retains possession. That encourages attacking play, and also ensures that your opponents will do their utmost to take the ball from you. Sliding tackles are also used in this exercise. All the techniques you've learned can now gradually be put into practice. Exercise seven, not two against two, but three against three. Just a little while longer and we'll be playing 11 aside in a real match. But for the time being, what we're doing is practicing. And the main thing you must remember is to use all the feints you've learned and all the techniques for beating a player. Use them all often. Try everything. Great. There is little point practicing kicking techniques with boys who have not developed a feeling for the ball. It has been proved in practice that the best footballers have always had excellent kicking techniques. They have not had to spend a lot of hours practicing this simply because so much of kicking technique is a matter of feeling for the ball. These players can usually give a long pass accurately because they are free from the ball and they can search the field while they judge the possibilities of playing to teammates 40-50 meters away. The young players who have learned the different categories of ball control will also have excellent kicking technique with both legs which makes it easier for them to develop strength in the leg which they don't use as much. It is often the inability to kick with the other foot that causes loss of possession simply because there isn't any time to place the ball in the front of the foot the player prefers. I think you must be born with it. Then later you can perfect it with constant practice. In my early years, I used to practice a lot in the street between two apartment blocks where there was a little grass besides the street. There were also little balconies behind the goalpost. You really had to aim well. That helped me because the pass had to be on target. I have been blessed for being able to learn in that situation. En dan moet je echt uh, goed mikken en zo doen, dan krijg je een zuivere paas. Ik denk dat ik het daaraan te, denk, te danken heb. You should begin to practice kicking techniques only when you have mastered the various skills dealt with in the previous installments. Here you see a kicking exercise. Lifting the ball, place the foot well under the ball and lift it over the keeper's head. So, foot under the ball, over the keeper. Goal. Kicking technique is largely feel for the ball. Really gifted players were more or less born with this. Others acquire it through long and intensive practice with the ball but it's something everyone can learn. The secret is constant practice. Foot well under the ball and lift it. Really get it up so that it curves over the keeper as he makes a desperate leap for it. A glorious moment for any footballer. Master the art through long practice and you are becoming a real footballer. Practice with both feet. The second exercise, kicking with the inside of the foot. You don't have quite enough power yet to make use of the full potential of this method of kicking. 
But soon you'll notice that you can send the ball over a large part of the field with a high degree of accuracy by using the inside of your foot. This second exercise is also for both feet. Follow through properly with your kicking leg. The ball curves and spins. When you're centering, this makes it difficult for the goalkeeper and the defenders to judge where it's going to land. Your own players know because you've been practicing it with them regularly. The third exercise. Put the ball over the keeper with the inside of the instep. Make sure you follow through with your shooting leg. This gives the ball speed and makes it possible to put side on it. The kicking techniques can be practiced in a combined form. Which technique you use depends on the distance you want to kick the ball. You should talk about this with your coach. Here you have it in slow motion. Hit the ball with the inside of your instep and really follow through with your leg. This helps to make you more supple and it enables you to put side on the ball. The ball sails over the keeper and finishes up in the goal. Beautiful, the way the ball goes into the net. Exercise four, kicking with the instep. Six players form a circle. You kick to the player to your right. Four balls are used. For this method of kicking, you have to get your body well over the ball. Accuracy is, of course, extremely important. In matches, even between top-ranking teams, you often see so many bad passes that you wonder whether they ever do any passing practice. You should be able to put the ball where you want it, blindfolded. It's just a question of practice. In exercise five, we're chiefly concerned with one touch technique, hitting the ball alternately long and short. As you'll also be constantly using kicking techniques when you're practicing receiving passes and running with the ball, making one-two combinations and shooting, all these things will help to improve your kicking ability. Try one-touch passes, alternately short and long, to learn the art of quick, accurate passing. Exercise six. Here you kick with the outside of the foot. It's a difficult exercise because you need a lot of power for it. But if you have developed a good feel for the ball, you'll find that your kicking gets better and better. Kicking with the outside of the foot. Take a good look in slow motion. You can put side on the ball with the outside of your foot. If your coach stretches a cord, or you can do it yourself, you can hit the ball so that it curves away and comes back to the cord. The ball curves around an imaginary opponent. That was kicking technique. Heading is at least as important. Being able to head well is an essential skill, both for defenders and for attackers. We'll learn all about that next.